Um, thank you for coming tonight. I'll, I'll not be here too long. I'm just going to introduce Matthew Williams, who come tonight to talk about mental health and, and your next journey and how we how we can. Because I think mental health is one of the things with menopause, perimenopause, that uh, doesn't get talked about. So we've got tonight, and we've also got next week as well around stress vulnerability and mental health. So um, St is Stephen still here? Has he gone? Stephen. Hello, have you, are we ready to start? Or have we started? Oh, yeah. Is that been on or <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm loud anyway, I can shout. You're all right. Um, all right, we're ready. Um, uh, Catherine, just before, I, what was the name of that move drug again? <laughs> the moob drug. To mock the do you need some? Just log that. Right. Um, <laughs> you get that bargain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I say next time I come, I'll be all buff. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's, it's really good to be here, and, um, and and thank you, Catherine. It was really good listening and getting a feel and a sense of obviously what this group's about and what you're trying to achieve. I uh, met with Catherine a few weeks ago and um, you know it's clear she's very driven and, and, and that kind of passion is what creates change and so I don't doubt that you're going to help make a big difference. So it's uh, really good that I can be here and, 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 and play my own little part in, in, in helping you, hopefully. Um, I've been a bit thrown off. I'm a big, big music fan. I have a kind of traumatic memory. I just noticed the Barry Manilow thing there. When I was a kid, on a Monday at school, I must have only been about six or seven, something like that, you had to write uh, what you'd done at the weekend. I remember writing uh, that my mum my had been eyeing and listening to a Barry Manilow album, and it was that one. Um, and for some, somehow the teacher told her, I don't know why, but anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm a big music fan, hence uh, I don't know if anyone picks up the, the lyrical reference as the title. Yeah. Changes, David Boy, very clever, eh? Um, so yeah, that, and, and, and meaning mental health and writing your next chapter, so that's what we're going to cover this evening. Now, first question that I asked myself many, many, many times, who am I and what am I doing here? <laughs> you might be wondering the same, because... Uh, Clearly, I've not been through the menopause. Uh, I am a single bloke, so I'm not with someone that's going through the menopause or the perimenopause. So, who am I? What am I doing here? What do I kind of bring that hopefully can, can help you? Well, first of all, a little bit about me. So, I'm a... Um, there's not kind of one title. There's not one title that defines <laughs> me. But... Um, so uh, I, I kind of work for myself now, but my uh, key things I do, so I, I, I write a lot, um, I, I, I wrote a book, uh, Something Changed, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little as we go through. I'm, uh, my big passion and, and, and the thing that I tend to get my soapbox out for a lot, another area that's very under-resourced and, and, and badly needs more attention is around mental health. And so that's, um, actually, that's what I'm passionate about. And I run community-based. I create my own programs that uh, have a boxing theme. I, I worked for 11 years for the National Governing Body of Boxing. Passionate about boxing. And, 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 and it's a very powerful metaphor for, for struggle, for overcoming challenges, things like that. So it works well in terms of the, the, the mental health and particularly engaging men around mental health. So... That's kind of what I spend the bulk of my time doing now, creating and, and, and delivering those programs. I'm also a parent who is a very recent Harry Styles convert, having been uh, badgered into going with my daughter. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I have to say I was very, very, I'm a big music fan, out, but uh, he's on my uh, Spotify playlist now. Um, I also spend a lot of time trying to avoid my daughter's embarrassing Snapchat filters. She tends to catch me um, in all kinds of random pauses and then turns me into a piece of broccoli. Um, and my my son, uh, so they're the kind of, uh, in terms of meaning, give me a great sense of meaning in my life. So, a little bit about me. So, in terms of what... Um, 
I kind of bring to the table in terms of this and, and, and the experience I bring that hopefully means that I can provide some information that may resonate with and help you is from my own story this is a talk that I gave uh, the, the talk I'm going to do isn't but this particular title was a talk I gave to uh, members of staff at Quorn last year three breakdowns and a divorce so in terms of my story um, I've experienced um, mental health problems myself had three very bad episodes of depression and was divorced so uh, navigating a major life change when I was approaching 40 and I thought right my life's how it is and then suddenly bang my whole life's turned upside down um, again so I've navigated that and, and, and so what I've kind of learned through those experiences my nature if you like is I'm someone that likes to learn from things likes to grow likes to quest and challenge all those things so I've learned a lot from those things and I now want to use to help other people that might be going through similar things and uh, so now I got my soapbox and I shout about it so this is um so in terms of what I'm going to cover, um, as the title suggested, the stuff around meaning, around mental health, and around writing your next chapter, what comes after a significant change in your life. And uh, it, now it, it, it's always hard to pitch these things in terms of the depth, so I'll go through and then I'm, I'm happy to take any questions if you want to know more about any particular thing, or I'm more than happy to, to, to answer if I can. So, my first question I always like to ask I started off that with um, who am I um, when we're looking at issues of, of, of change and, and significant change and and of you know navigating anything in our lives one of the most powerful things we can have is a real strong powerful sense of self of really knowing who we are and that is very Again, powerful in terms of helping us to, to navigate whatever challenges life throws our way. Of course, I'm from Middlesbrough, so I have to word it, who are you? Because that tends to be how we talk. Uh, I try not to. Uh, and I don't take my shirt off very much these days, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, so who are you? So th th and, and this is something that's of a great interest to me. Th this whole sense of who we are and our sense of identity. And... Again, it's very strongly linked to our mental health, but it's also something that can be very much challenged by any major change in our life. Because that whole, you know, we, we, who we are is very much linked to, you know, our, obviously our beliefs our, uh, about, about ourselves, about the world, about, um, you know, our our experiences, our relationships, the environments that we find ourselves in. So when any of those things change, and particularly when it's a significant change, it can really cause us to question ourselves and who we are. That can have a, an impact on our mental health, either negatively or positively. Now, it sounds easy, doesn't it? It sounds great. Yeah, uh, know thyself. And I remember going back to my childhood and I used to uh, enjoy watching I don't know. I used to always enjoy watching the things my mum was watching. I remember, like, pretending I wasn't watching Dallas when really I was. <laughs> and the the when you know people used to, I used to pick up these things, sort of people taking time to get to know themselves. Oh, what a lot of rubbish. How can you not know yourself? You're with yourself every day. But of course, you know, because we don't necessarily question things about ourselves until life forces us to. And and it's, like, it's hard as well. It's not just facing certain truths about ourselves. It's hard. And it's easier not to. So actually, it can take a real conscious effort to get to know ourselves. And again, and that's an ongoing process. Because, um, you know, we're always a work in progress. So, again, this is a foundation for pretty much everything that I do really. About, you know, really getting to know yourself. And it's been a big part of my path. Going back to lyrics, one of the things that I... Uh, again, those experiences of, 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 of struggling with my mental health, of, um, of, of, of going through divorce and, and subsequent dating, adventures, disasters, whatever you want to call them, um, is that, you know, really, this sense of, uh, well, first of all, does anyone recognise what this is from? The Verve Bittersweet Symphony, one of the lyrics, I'm a million different people from one day to the next. Because I think we often we try and have this clear definition of ourselves. This is who I am. Or and other people will have those for us, fit us into certain boxes. But actually, we're very complex creatures. And part of my thing has been 
actually being able to accept and own or you know all these kind of cliches the the contradictions in me and the fact that you realize when you know i found that going from this stable marriage and then suddenly being out on my own you know i'd never even have my own bedroom in my whole life to suddenly being on my own i was in my mate's spare bedroom for a while but then having my own house and all of this so you know getting used to that and again it I found different, I found myself acting in certain ways. It's like, well, where did that come from? And it's really like different people, different situations, different experiences, draw up different things in you. And so the relevance here is obviously going through significant changes. Um, and, it, you know, I'd say not just the menopause, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. But, it, it, you know, there's, there's knock-on effects in, you know, in terms of relationships. And you mentioned that about your ability to work. You know, if we define ourselves by our contribution at work, for instance. So there's a lot of links to how these things can impact on our identity, our sense of self, and therefore on our mental health. So, um, like I said, we're very... Um, complex creatures um do you think men are complex creatures or do people see us as quite simple sometimes i don't know um and we don't understand each other obviously uh, so i'll just tell you from from a, a man's side although like i said i have heard barry Manilow and watch dallas um one of the things about us uh, a big part of who we are is chemical and obviously this is something that is a, 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 a big, and obviously, you know, talking about hormones, testosterone. Again, I'm not going to sit and pretend that I'm, you know, any sort of expert on, on, on understanding the specifics of that. The key thing is this, that we are chemical machines. The, you know, dopamine, serotonin, you know, um, uh, 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 adrenaline. I mean, just, you know, adrenaline, um, uh, diabetes, diabetes, insulin, you know, it's all this, you know, hormones, uh, chemicals. And so, any again, obviously, any change in that could affect how we function physically, how we function men mentally. You mentioned about brain fog. Again, obviously, you'd be far more aware of, of those kind of things than, than I will. One of the things I want to highlight here, though, with regards to mental health, is that yes, the chemical element is is a part of it. But again, and speaking from the point of view of some you know, my direct experience of depression, it's so much more than that. And there's become this almost prevailing narrative that depression is a chemical caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. We know very, very little about about depression, about mental health, and, and about how the brain about how the brain works. And so a lot of these things are theories. And when you kind of see anything, you'll see things like it is thought that, it is suggested that. Rather than that's how it is, because there isn't, you know, a baseline measure of serotonin levels. I don't know if it's about whether it's serotonin levels in the brain, whether it's about what's circulating in the bloodstream, the, the, the theories. But this kind of narrative seems to have taken hold. And one of the things that that does is it can almost put us at the mercy of a mental health problem. Because, well, it's just uh, our it's just our chemicals. And I'm very interested in people having a sense of agency over what's happening to them. So yes, there's a chemical element, but we're not a slave to that's it, it's chemical. Again, there might be an element, and so say, in terms of antidepressants might might help. And, and again, you know, you talk about hormone replacement therapies. Again, I'm not going to sit and pretend or stand and pretend that I know a lot about that. But that can be one part of the picture for some people. We're all different. We all have to navigate our own way through challenges around mental health, around, again, identity, all of these things. So... Like I said, I'm, there's a, there's much more to mental health than than the chemicals in our in our brain. Um, struggling with our mental health impacts on chemicals in the brain, and our brain function changes. But it's just you know what's the symptom, what's the cause? Um, again, if I'm stressed out, I'll have more adrenaline. Uh, but it, it, again, it, 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 it's it, the, the, the whole cause and effect um, can sometimes get, get confused. So what do I, I want to talk kind of in terms of mental health and well-being, things that are good for mental health and well-being. I want to talk kind of more broadly around it. Like I said, it, in terms of knowing where to pitch it, I just want to kind of give you this kind of broad view of a few things that are considered to be very, very, well, are very, very helpful. Um, and like I said, at the end, if you've got any more questions, can ask now 
I always, always, always like to refer to this, the five ways to well-being. Has anyone come across this before? Yeah, a few. What I love about this is because these are all things that can be pretty easily implemented by anyone in our day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, we might have certain things that were challenged for whatever reason, but by and large, again, we're not at the mercy of waiting for an antidepressant to work or uh, you know, waiting to see a therapist that might take six months or a year. Um, these are things that, again, goes back to that agency, things that we can do to help ourselves. Now, the five ways to well-being came from, excuse me, um, it was on 2008, an uh, organisation called the New Economics Foundation were commissioned to do this piece of work around things that keep uh, the things that contribute to our mental health and, and, and well-being. And I think at the time it was referred to as like this happiness index. We measure it was commissioned by government because we measure the success or the health of a nation often by economic factors. You know, we look at uh, you know the, the, the still report the stocks and shares on on, on the news of an evening. Going back, I think the one point you may hear about people, the, the sickness impact. One of the things that really bothers, does it bother me? Yeah, it does, about mental health. It becomes a headline when it costs employers a load of money. Yeah. Well, what about the cost to me and to my family when I'm going through it? So, where did, how did I get on to that? Uh, so I told you I always bring my soapbox. Um, but the, the, yeah, so it was commissioned because about that, you know, a, another way to kind of understand the health of, 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 of the nation. But also, um, we all, don't want to speak for anyone, but most of us know what, when I say, what's your five a day? What is it? Fruit and, fruit and veg. We all know it, don't we? That we five fruit and veg a day is generally good for our, for our health. This is about having something similar, simple messages that we can all implement around looking out after our mental well-being. And this is all research. This was all research back, so this is all empirical uh, stuff that went into developing this. So, the five ways to well-being that were identified: being active. Um, and I was mentioned. Say, I worked in sport for over twenty years, and <laughs> believe it or not, I was an athlete myself in the day. But the um, you talk about kind of the, the the you know the happy hormones, endorphins. We can feel better about ourselves in terms of um, you know our self-esteem, how we look, how we feel. Um, besides, I, I prefer to use, so people think of kind of physical activity, there can be a lot of negative associations, particularly if people didn't like PE at school, we can tend to think of sport, which again is not for everyone, it's just about moving more, think about how we build more activity in our daily lives, moving more, I mean, a lot of people have these nowadays, don't they, and measuring our steps and, you know, it can be, you know, taking the stairs instead of the lift, but it's just conscious thing about how we can move more, how we can build more activity into our day. Connect. Massive, 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 massive one. We're social species. We all like to feel that we belong, we're understood, we're heard. Our connections with others are really, really important to us. Obviously, fantastic example of that is here. When we're struggling with something, being around other people that get it, and, and there's a strength in that kind of connection. You know, when you share a common, dare I say, suffering, dilemma, whatever, you know, there can be a real kind of strong connection that can form through that. But connections all, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but the, the, this one, it's a big one for me, and I focus a lot on this in, in the work that I do. It's connection with other people, it's connection with other things as well, connection with a sense of meaning and purpose, with meaningful work, with, um, with nature. All of these things are important to us, and if we feel disconnected from those things it will have a negative impact on our mental health and there's a brilliant book by a guy called Johan Harry that's about that and again it takes about we have this very medical view of depression or anxiety of mental health again chemical that it needs to be treated by uh, by by antidepressants but actually this has the element of, of connection the massive one in terms of the way we live now and you say you know what if the problem wasn't you but it's the world that we live in now and it, it's a really powerful way of looking at it but of course that's much harder to change than saying you're the problem <laughs> i'll gotta take a tablet and go away i'm not saying people say about anyway um take notice is the third one this essentially nowadays the tend to be this what often people call this mindfulness being present being in the moment uh being conscious of our senses uh, what we can see, what we can smell, what we can hear. I don't know about any of you during lockdown going for walks, 
I hear the birds sing. Never noticed before, but it's because you didn't have all the cars going by. So, again, tune into what's around us, being mindful. And what that do, again, it takes us out of our head. It stops us from um, worrying about uh, or, or regretting the past, being anxious about the future, but living kind of skillfully presently in the here and now. Keep learning, very uh, stimulates us mentally, again, self esteem through growing, learning. Uh, Greater knowledge, experience. Gear doesn't have to be formal. Can be conversation with a friend that uh, you know explores a particular issue. Um, you know, TED talks, whatever it might be. However, we learn. But again, that constant growing, questioning, challenging, intellectual stimulation. Again, very good for our well-being. And the final one is about giving. And this can be going back to the kind of connection. Uh, also, I think taking notice. You know, giving of ourself in terms of our attention, our time, a smile to somebody. It can be something like, I guess, you know, Catherine's doing in terms of setting up something like this, giving something to people that can can, can help uh, can help them in, in their lives in some way. Um, now, it can be formal, it can be informal, but one of the things that that can do is it take again takes us kind of out of ourselves when we're really struggling with our mental health and and, and depression is terrible for this. It really turns us inward. And it's, it can be a very selfish illness. Not in a, I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a judgmental way, but we become absolutely consumed by it. And so opportunities, and I'm not suggesting it's easy, because it's hard to do anything when you're experiencing that. But those opportunities that go out of, out of yourself, kind of being present for others, helping others, uh, can take you out of that kind of brain space, even if it's just kind of for a moment. So... And I was involved in a, with a, uh, a local mental health charity on a project that used volunteering as a, as a, as a way of helping mental health because of that basis of, of giving as being something that's good for us. Now, all of this, again, it's stuff that we can build into our day-to-day -day lives. And there's some really good resources where it says, you know, what you can do on each of those if you have 10 minutes spare, if you have an hour spare, or if you have a full day. So if we look at the Connect, if I've got 10 minutes, I might drop my mate a message on Messenger. I've got an hour, you know, you want to catch up for a drink? Got a full day, let's have a full day out somewhere, we'll go to a festival, whatever it might be. So again, the, the, you know, the, we can look at how we can incorporate that within our own lives, depending on our circumstances. Now, one of the things um, Catherine mentioned about, about anxiety to me, and that's something a lot of people report kind of... Um, experiencing and this is a just a simple a simple uh, a good technique to remember that can really help in those moments when we feel very anxious stop um, as this is a pause for a moment take a breath all this is kind of allowing a bit of time and space between our thoughts and our feelings and our reaction to them Taking a breath, then observing, links in with that taking notice, becoming observant of our thoughts, of our feelings. Pull back that detachment, getting some perspective on, on whatever it is that may be causing us to feel that way. And then practicing what works in terms of reducing that and proceeding. So it might be, uh, I mean, the, the breathing one is a good one. I mean, in, in so many of these things, it's starting with the breath, focus on the in-breath, the out-breath, feeling it going into your nose and out of your mouth, etc. Um, so again, that's something that's quite quite simple, but can be, be very effective as a kind of routine and a habit in terms of, um, as I said, that kind of pulling back, getting that perspective, and, and, and it gives us that, bit more sense of agency over being able to manage how we're feeling and the other uh, so I'd say that's kind of immediate thing and there's two you know generally speaking there's kind of when we talk about kind of anxiety and anxious thoughts I often say about uh, the, the um, kind of distraction from it so place now focus somewhere else so if there's a particular thought for instance that's causing it we can't just tell us to stop thinking that because like if you know don't think of a pink elephant it's there we need to distract it and divert it somewhere else so there's that diversion there's also the physical activity is a, is a good one as a way of kind of burning that and those physical sensations that we get as a way of um, ameliorating those those feelings now some of the other things that 
very helpful. A lot of these you'll, you'll recognise. It's general kind of, it's your good health. It's your basics on your, your diet, your sleeping, um, mention physical activity. Um, we kind of all know these things to some extent or other, but like a lot of things, because we know something doesn't mean we live it, doesn't mean we apply it. And sometimes there's that thing about going back to basics and actually looking at these kind of foundations of good health, whether it be mental health or physical health. And personally, I'm a big believer in health because the two are linked. Um, and, and obviously there's specific, you know, there's much more specific information on each of those, in the game, which I won't go into, but anyone interested in any of those particular areas, there's further information that I can signpost to. Um, and meditation as well, I mean, particularly with kind of anxiety, I think, you know, meditation, I, I've always found, would be a brilliant thing in terms of helping us to detach from our thoughts, to recognise that our thoughts aren't us. The, it, it talks about becoming a curious and a conscious observer of our thoughts recognizing the nature of the mind is that thoughts just come and go all the time and we can choose in the same way we see a great cloud in the sky we can choose to watch it and follow it or we can notice it and go about our day um, so what we choose to follow and again under those gray clouds the blue sky is always underneath you know, some of these things sound like cliches but the good uh, again the good metaphors for for, for the mind and the nature of the mind um, so that's some kind of specific sort of around uh, again managing symptoms of mental health um, but I want to go into this kind of this bigger this bigger picture this bigger thing about who we are and our sense of self because like I said I'm a big believer that this is and I've seen it you know, both myself and other, a lot of other people I've worked with issues around identity um are often linked problems and well I'm gonna say problems with mental health but good mental health as well that strong sense of self and acceptance of self dare I say it, loving ourselves now our view of who we are and our sense of self comes from many places like I said about um, you know that our expectations of self of others our culture social norms now again all of these things can be getting relevant when we're going through particular changes now if we have a view of ourselves that is linked to again our ability to work or our role as a partner um you know and any of those things are impacted then clearly it can shake our sense of of self and make us question things now you know some of the things in terms of this stage of life where again you, you know, menopause perimenopause it doesn't sit isolated on its own as a thing again it might be the the, the corresponding with children leaving home for instance so again the fundamental role of your you know being a mother and and, and uh, you know all of these things that can really challenge who we are and it was really interesting Catherine when you said that about just generally yeah I, I've not heard that expression before about the sandwich thing and again it often can be defined by the role we play for other people and the expectations of other people and so I'm a big believer in that and so I say this because and I use this sentence a lot when I'm talking, a counsellor once said to me, and I was like, she said to me um, about, you know, I, I went over the, I'll tell a little bit. So I'd gone through a breakup after my, I'd, I'd, so I'd been with my ex-wife, we were together like 19 years, from when I was like uh, 20, uh, uh, 21. I'd been with someone else for two years before that, so I'd never really been single, I broke up, um, that, you know, it was over, moved on. Uh, make it sound really, oh, it was, yeah, it was over. It wasn't, wasn't quite that cut and dry. But anyway, um, but a few years down, like, I met someone that I really fell for, really fell for. And, uh, you know, and it came after a period of like, you know, geez, I'm going to be on my own forever. And anyway, and, and, and it broke up quickly, suddenly, and I was like, ugh, and I was heartbroken. And it really, really affected me. I mean, that's it, effectively, not, you know, in, in terms of how I felt. So I didn't have a breakdown. Um, and I, I just was, was, was gone. I was like, how? Like, I didn't feel like this after my marriage 19 years ended. <laughs> like, what? And anyway, I went to see this counsellor. Uh, <laughs> and I went in and she said, uh, right, so you have to tell me why you're here. So I sat down. Oh. So 10 minutes, so five minutes, however long, she let me kind of, I can go on as you realise, and then I'm going on, and she's right, but stop you there. 
And then she said, but, da, 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 and I was like, Jesus, that is me. That is my whole, within five minutes, you've just got me right down to a T. And she said, oh, and I didn't want to admit it, but she was, you know, the thing where you know someone's right, but it's really difficult to, you know, she can't be, but you know, I know she is. And she said, she goes, you come in, <laughs> she goes, and you're like this puppy that just said, love me. And I'm like, that's pathetic. But that, She's right, I am. And she said, what we need, right, forget about her. And da, da, da. She said, we need to give you a real strong sense of who you are. And I'm like, well, I'm very self-reflective. I always have been. This isn't the first time I've been in counselling. And, but it was, I think, yeah, she's onto something here. And really, but what it was, it was that a, I realised I had a sense of self that could be too easily knocked by my acceptance of, from other people, what other people expected me to be, having to prove myself to other people. And that was a life changer for me. Um, because when you have that strong sense of who you are, and again, your other roles in life, your roles in life, who you are to other people, bro, we all need those things. But it doesn't change our sense of who we are. That remain, And that from that, we have boundaries. We have, you know, we start doing things that we know are good for us and our mouth rather than doing things for other people that we know actually aren't good for us. So anyway, so that's kind of a bit of how I got to be in the strong, self-assertive person I am today. Um, so where I, a massive part of me creating, yeah, I was going to say creating that self. Yeah, it is. It's about, it's an act of creation because of this point. For me, I started writing about it. I was never a writer. I just had a compulsion one night where I'm going through certain stuff. I've got to write there. I've got to, I just had to, I had to write and I had to share it. I, I had no idea why, just, and I did. And I could go on, but I won't. Um, but the key thing that that whole thing did, so I wrote, I wrote, it all came out, I processed it. It un revealed things about myself. It helped me make connections between things. Ultimately, what I was doing was creating a narrative around the things that had happened to me in my life. And one of the things I think, in terms of why I had to make a point, I remember I had a, this, um, my mum and dad, my dad in particular, struggled with it initially because I started putting this out, stuff out into the world like, you know, bloody hell, mate. Um, you know, I'm on my own. It wasn't like that. Because of the point being, and he said to me, why do you, yeah, you know, I'm sounds therapeutic and, and, and write it, great, but why do you have to share it? Um, my counsellor said, they're from a generation that were judged if their step wasn't clean. You put in that, and of course there's a reflection, you know, people presume, you know, he must have had a bad upbringing if he's going, you know. So anyway, so I, I get it. Um, but it made me really question, why do, I, why do I put it out in the world? Believe it or not, I'm not a kind of centre of attention type check me out person, but why do I do, I do that? And I realised it was because, one, it, 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 it helped me. But there's something about putting yourself out there that makes you accountable. And I was determined, in terms of where, what I was going through at that moment, that someday the people that read that are going to be able to see, bloody hell, I remember when he started, look what's happening now. And I didn't have any grand ideas that, oh, I'm going to go and do this and this and this. It wasn't like that. But somewhere in me that was there. And also it was that I couldn't just be a sad sack. I don't want, you know, I don't want sympathy. I don't want people thinking, oh, poor little Matthew. I wanted every post that I wrote, every chapter is, there's a point to this. There's a purpose. There's something I can learn from it and I can turn this to good. And so putting it out publicly kind of forced me to do that. So I created this narrative. And so this whole thing of our stories, it became something that was more and more interesting to me and our ability to fashion our story and create our story and then for create our sense of self. And so, I, so it's like, who are you? First and foremost, you're a storyteller because our identity, our values, our very lives are the product of the stories that we tell ourselves each day. So what stories are you telling about yourself and is it time to write a new one? And Again, the, what, the reason I thought this was particularly relevant for the group is that major life changes really can focus you in on this. 
because it's like bloody hell you know when we're really struggling with something you can reflect you know i'm aware i want to be is this all there is is the more actually one of the things you often hear the people that i work with i feel like i'm living someone else's life you know if you meet your i'm having a joke with a friend about this earlier you know 40 years time if you meet yourself are they gonna say brilliant or are they gonna say what the hell did you do you could have been this and so can, and again, and going through these you know, real struggles that force us to question ourselves, um, again, it, it questions it. And I wanted to create something that helps people through that, through having helping to, to, to rewrite their narrative. Because in the state, I talk about like, a, I have a, a program around this. It's like a film that we have the power to, when we look at a scene, we might see it from one character's perspective, but there's different camera angles, there's different characters, and they will all see something different. And again, we're, you know, we are what we tell ourselves. You know, we might have very firmly held beliefs, but they're just that, the beliefs, the stories, that's what, who we are as a species. It's how we came to be top of the food chain because we have imagination, we create, we make sense of the world through storytelling, we connect with others through storytelling. All religions are based on telling a story that helps us to make sense of the world and our place in it. So essentially that's what my book um, was all about. That was my, my becoming up to that point because we're always like uh, works in progress. So what that led to for me was brilliant. And uh, so I, I like to share some of my funny moments. So does anyone watch Alan Partridge? So Alan Partridge uh, is a kind of spoof TV presenter. And there was this scene in one of the pros where he's pitching, he's desperate to stay on telling he's pitching ideas. Uh, to the executive and he says uh, youth hosteling with Chris Eubank and I had to use my youth hosteling with Chris Eubank moment was when I was asked if I would do a feature on men's mental health on ITV's Lorraine with Louis Spence <laughs> <laughs> that email landing on my desktop was a surprise you know I'm working in boxing you know with all these uh, I'm going chat with Louis, have a dance, go on then. And that's it, and I just say yes to everything. Um, so I did that, I've been in big national campaigns with uh, with my best friend there, again, because it was a connection, support. I was in a video with uh, Glenn Close, uh, the Hollywood actress, with she also Nadia Hussain from the Great British Break Off, and he had this brilliant graphic made for me that I love and I like to keep using. The point of me sharing that, again, I'm not a centre of, it's not a centre, I like sharing if I've got something to say and I think it can help people, I'm in my element, but generally I'm not, hey, just look at me. Um, but I'm not sharing this to kind of get on my high horse. The point of this is that the most amazing things can come from our struggles and from these significant things that can force us to question everything and out of the very worst thing I ever went through, the best things, things I could never have possibly imagined came from them. I, if you'd have sat, right, if, well, when I was, so let's say when I was at my worst, if you stuck me at the back of that room there, um, told me all of this, told me my book, I'd have said, I can't do that. But I did, and I did it that once at a time. And again, it's that you have the ability that to write your story, to, to set that I'm trying to you know, put it in the words, but that, you know, you define what your life is going to be like. You know, you have that ability. And so I always use these kind of boxing examples, but it is that point that, and again, going back to obviously, you know, the, you know Catherine, you're a great example of, you know, just where you were a few weeks ago. I mean, you know, when I met you and you saying that you were, I think you stopped work and, um, you know, to, to being here, uh, haranguing in the very nicest way, your local MP. But you know, it's like turning it into something that, and again, and, and whatever that is in your life, you can do that. And I, the reason I say, I, I'm just some bloke from Borough, I mean, bloody hell, I, you know, and I'm with Glenn Close on a video. Um, so the next chapter and the ability to write the next chapter, and this is what I kind of want to focus on, it's that, you know, the, the, any so it comes with that opportunity to define who you want to be and what you, you know, and if you are questioning your role in life and your role 
within your family, at work, wherever it is, that, you know, th there is that opportunity to think about what you want your next chapter to be. And I'll just check if I... Yes. So a, a big the kind of, and, um, central pillar, if you like, of, of what I do around this is that, you know, who's holding the pen that is writing your story? Again, is it the expectations of others? Is it a particular person who either, you know, through past experience or current that, you know, maybe influences y your life direction more than ideally you'd want them to? Um, again, just a couple of examples. There's all these different influences that might be at play in writing the chapters of our lives. Now, I talk about plot twists in this. Life happens. Things happen that we can't control. We'd all like to be able to control everything in our life. We can't. But again, it comes back to this strong sense of self that helps us to navigate our way through that in a way that's best for us. Um, but So again, we can't control all of that, but we can hold a lot of... Um, the, the, the power over that pen in terms of how we respond to things and the sense of direction in terms of where we want the, the, those challenges and changes to take us. And something that I, I think really, really helps focus the mind on this. This was a realisation I had when, again, you know, depression, the most lonely, isolated and horrific experience I've ever been through. And... I couldn't go through anything worse. It's impossible. You know, yes, terrible things can happen. They will happen because that's life. Nothing can be worse than that. And I was on my own. There's people around me, you know, people that cared for me. When it came to it, in the middle of the night, when I couldn't sleep, but I was exhausted, and the nights were dragging, and there was so, it was horrific. And there was only me there. And brought home this point on the last page of your story there's only one person that's guaranteed to be there just one and that's you you know you, it might you might be surrounded by everyone you love you might not and the people that you love the today you know they might move away they might you know, who knows but when it comes to it again we've got to answer to ourselves first we've got to look after and be our best selves first and that helps us to be the best we can be for other people as well there's a lot about you know the people talk about selfish and there's talk, there's a slogan that goes around a lot in mental health self-care isn't selfish but that it there's the whole notion that actually looking after ourselves should be seen as a selfish act you know it's like but there is almost that perceived pressure on us. And so I use this thing to really focus the mind. That you know, that you know, on the last you you can't guarantee that there's anyone else gonna be there. That you, so you, you know, you've got to be at that point, you know what? I'm where I, my final chat there, my like it says what I want it to say. Um and from that, one of my I was pleased when I came up with this. It's like you know, kind of unique ways of getting your points across because this whole analogy of the story you're you are the leading actor in your story um well, that has got to fit the story that you're living because if it doesn't that causes a lot of distress whether it's bubbling under the surface or whether it emerges in a powerful way there's a saying about the most the worst pain is a bearable one because it doesn't force you to do anything about it. When you're really struggling with something, it can force you to take that because you have to, because there's no other option. And so, so when you're, you know, it, if you're at that point where, again, you're questioning your role in life, whether you're living the life that you were meant to live, where, you know, however you kind of, your worldview, however you wrap it up, the story has got to match you as the leading actor. You wouldn't put Rocky in a rom-com. doesn't fit. So that your having that clear sense of self helps you to create that life that is best and right for you as the leading character, you as the leading actor in that story. So it's about using that, you know, there's always lessons in these kind of challenges. We can learn things about ourselves, about life, about the people <coughs> around us. We don't necessarily always see that right at the time because sometimes it's just getting through this day, getting through tomorrow. But 
it offers those opportunities, a, a point in time of, re, of reflecting, and you will be learning a lot as you go through, um, <laughs> as you go through the change. You know, is that, is that, can you say that? Yeah, yeah the change, right, okay. Um, and I love this quote. Yeah, I love my music. Find what makes your heart sing and create your own music. I love that. Uh, I, I mean, I had a client before I came here today. We were talking about you know, a big thing that's emerging. That other people's expectations of her, what other people think of her, they made me feel like that. She thought this of me. Who cares? That's something. And I, I used to think that a lot. Um, again, having been where I've been, been through what I've been through, couldn't give a monkey's what anyone else thinks because I didn't go through all of that to live to please someone else. That sounds terrible. I don't know, very sad. But, you know, I want to, but not at my expense, not to my detriment. And proof of that, because you can't please everyone all the time. And this is my favourite review turning a negative into a positive. I don't know what book she was reading, but I'm sure I didn't write that. Uh, Apparently, it's horrible self-indulgent raging, replete with... I mean, there are some vulgar comments, but not on my obvious lack of confidence in my virility. I don't know where that came from. Um, but, yeah, you do you. And you know that. You, uh, again, sing your own song. So, that's me. Thank you. I, I don't know how long I've witted on for. But, uh, thank you very much.